You're listening to the Platte River Bard. We are honored to bring you two of the creatives at Opera Omaha, Lauren Medici, Director of Engagement Programs, and Andrea Joy Pearson, Director of Belonging and Inclusion. Opera Omaha is bringing Nebraska an amazing season filled with a variety of themes and stories. Now, we really wanted to use this episode to celebrate everything Opera Omaha is doing, and we are so excited to finally get to do a podcast with him in person this year instead of over the phone. Uh, Lauren talked with us about the engagement team's mission at Opera Omaha. We think about it in the space of, uh, especially within our engagement programming, we think of it as opera is our toolbox. We have all of these different art forms that are present and all of these different artists and creatives that are present to make an opera happen. And when we do programming, we can pull out all of those different art forms and artists and elements in those creative aspects. And we want to find what's the thing that sparks for someone. Andrea, who also has her Master's of Music in Voice and Opera and now works on the engagement and HR function of Opera Omaha, talks about her role and the direction Opera Omaha is taking with their new season. I really think of myself as a space creator. I really love creating space for creatives, right? For them to be able to do their thing and to be able to speak authentically because the whole idea is that art should say something, right? And so I like to be an advocate for creatives to be able to say, how do we create spaces where you can say what it is that that is authentic to you? And to know that this art form is much wider than just historically what it's been of primarily white people control controlling it. Um, and so having that level of, of authenticity in the space. Um, and it's been really exciting to get into the, the producing and directorial side of that. And creating space for all voices means Opera Omaha has created amplifying the Black experience to honor, celebrate, and bring awareness to the multifaceted stories of the Black community. And a new and exciting project, which we get into during the podcast, begins their season on November 4th by bringing an opera about the life and times of Malcolm X. And and I think this opera will really open people's minds to what Malcolm X's life was all about, what's the legacy that came from it, and you feel like you get to go on a historical journey, and there's something super unique in particular about this opera that you will be hard-pressed to find, and that is, it actually starts in Omaha. At Opera Omaha, these are creatives working to make opera accessible to everyone. From their free annual event, Opera Outdoors, to their fellowship program, Opera to Go, Opera in Conversations, and Talkbacks before and after productions. Their season stretches the gamut of time and stories with Malcolm X to Puccini to Mozart. And it's all here in our great state. And Opera Omaha is ready and willing to make a connection to all of us. And then we're kind of going like backwards in time, yes. right? So we we have we have uh, X, the life and times of Malcolm X. We have Sor Angelica that comes, and then we have the Marriage of Figaro. The Marriage of Figaro premiered in May of 1786 in Vienna, Austria. Now, in 2017, the BBC News magazine asked almost 200 opera singers what they thought was the best opera. The Marriage of Figaro was listed as number one of the 20 operas featured. It has been said that the play itself outshined Mozart's score, and it's considered to be one of the greatest operas ever written. And I think that The Marriage of Figaro is an interesting choice as well, because even though it was a comedy about a marriage, at the time of the revolution, it was banned. Some say because it depicted servants rising up against their masters, which enraged the aristocracy at the time. Yet the librettist, Lorenzo de Ponte, according to his memoirs, said it was banned for his supposed sexual references. Regardless of the controversy, it prevailed and has managed to live on ever since. In Soir Angelica, which premiered in New York City in December of 1918, we see a nun who is estranged from her wealthy family who doesn't understand her. 
She then wrestles with some of her painful choices in life versus the rules of her Catholic religion. These two operas are really interesting pieces about people experiencing life, along with some of the best music from famous composers Mozart and Puccini. Any of these operas would be a great starting point if you're just wanting to begin a journey into opera. There's so much to talk about, and yet another great example for us to highlight the creatives who are bringing us new art in new ways. We have the whole conversation about the 2022-23 season here at the Platte River Bard. And we are here today at the Hot Shops. Hot Shops. Once again, and we are here with Lauren <laughs> Medici, she is the director of engagement programs at Opera Omaha. We are also here with Andrea Joy Pearson. She is the director of belonging and inclusion and at Opera Omaha. And also, she is the creative director of amplifying the black experience. Thank you both for Thank joining us you. here at the old hot shops today. Thank Thanks you. for having us. And and we have been we have talked to Upper Omaha before. We've talked yes, to Lauren before. And has never been in person. So we're really excited this time to be able to be in person because of that darn COVID. <laughs> that's we that's are true. too. <laughs> <laughs> There's something special about being in person. Uh, that's yes. just a little bit different mm-hmm. when you're over the interwebs, right? So exactly. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yep. And I think our first um, podcast with her was when we still hadn't been able to figure out how we could see each other on the computer. So oh, we yes. literally that's was like right. a phone call. Mm, <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. So this is so much better. It is. So much <laughs> we graduated. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Come on. Oh, so really excited to spend that time with you guys. Thank you for talking with us. You have a lot of really exciting things yes. that are yeah. happening. Yeah. And I, I know that you've been in your position about a year now. Yeah. Just yeah. right about a year. Yeah. I just, I just hit over my year. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I moved here, um, not even a year ago. I moved here in October. So I'm almost hitting my year in Omaha and it's oh, been, wow. it's been an interesting experience. Yeah. 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 How do you like Omaha so far? Um, it's interesting, and I, I like it. The people are pretty nice overall. Um, I think there is this openness that exists here of people want to get to know you. People want to have conversations with you. Um, yeah. People want to connect you um, to their other friends that they have, and you start building out communities, yes. right? I feel like it's a space that it does feel really accessible to build community, right? And I think there's something really special about that, I and it's exciting to be yeah. um, mm-hmm. at a creative hub where we are trying to grow what community means and what community can look like. Yeah, yeah. Sure. absolutely. Yeah. So it's exciting. Yeah, and and you have a big task in front of you for your job, mm-hmm. and we, you've already kind of started some of some of the things that you'll be doing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about some what of your what your big objectives are for this position and and what you're doing at Opera Omaha? Yeah, sure. Um, I would say that. My big objective is the curation of spaces where everyone feels that they belong. Everyone feels like they're included in whatever is happening. And what that means to me is that people feel very respected, really valued, really heard, and ultimately they feel comfortable in a space, right? And so the ultimate objective is saying that opera is for everyone, right? So that means for the administrators in the space that's for the patrons that come into experiences and it's also for the creatives in the field right how does everyone who touches opera feel like they are a part of it yeah mm-hmm. yeah and you started out in opera and music yourself yeah right? yeah so you come from that background i do i do i'm a trained opera singer um oh, i i love opera and it's because of those experiences in the space um, that I have a, a, a little bit of a keen eye about where some some moments are of, of things that I didn't like during my tenure um, yeah. and things that I think can really grow out and make opera just super accessible, mm-hmm. um, at least way more accessible than maybe it's been in the past. And particularly as a black woman in the space, being able to represent that there's so much to this art form if only more people knew and more people felt like they could be a part of it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There really is a lot to it. I think that's really interesting um, talking about how you feel like um, 
it, it's sort of easy to make relationships and form community up here. Mm-hmm. Me not being from here either. Mm-hmm. I, I, I wasn't able to put my finger on that, but you're exactly right about mm-hmm. that. I found that as soon as I came up here. And yeah, he everybody's trying to connect people. you to somebody else. Yeah, people hey, found you know this, this guy, guy or, yeah. or you were over part of this thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That happens quite a bit. Particularly um, in the arts scene, yeah. in yeah. the creative yes. scene, right? Like there's this openness. And I I feel like there is this, um, at first, you know, you, you think you see something and you're like, oh, aren't I so great? And then you realize, oh, everybody sees it. <laughs> 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 um, but, but in that, in that, um, I think there are a lot of people that we're on one accord of realizing that Omaha is ready and set to become the the creative hub of the Midwest. I and it's, feel like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, if we can just get together, if we can just stay in a, some level of unity to do it, the possibilities feel just endless. It feels huge. It feels yeah, big. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> I, I, I'm getting that feeling as well, especially yeah. not being from here. Yeah. Uh, where did you come from? Kentucky, um, from, from, right? Well, no, that, that's where I got my oh. master's at the University of Kentucky. Yeah. Um, I'm So I have my master's in music from Kentucky, but I'm mm-hmm. actually from just outside of Atlanta. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, I just yeah. see Atlanta in there. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. So this this has been um, definitely a difference of culture. Um, sure. Definitely a difference of, of scene. Um, but I, I, do, I do enjoy it, right? Like, I do enjoy it. And there, there's just something exciting about being in a space that has a lot of possibilities to bloom and to blossom and to continue to grow out and to be in a space where you get to be um, an advocate of making sure that voices and people don't feel left out of those possibilities, right? And out of the growth, right? That that is set here, right? And particularly, this is a pretty segregated town. And so that was something that was just... In, different for me. Like I thought, I thought I knew right coming from the south, coming from somewhere like Atlanta. Right. Um, but it's it's a different experience, and it's kind of shocking different. how comfortably people talk about the segregation of oh, you know, the black people are in North Omaha, the white people are in West Omaha, and the Hispanic people are in South Omaha. And it, it really shocked me when I first got here of how just kind of flippant people were saying this, right? Because I think it's just people are used to it, but. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's it, not normal. Yeah. 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 Uh, I like, well, and, and speaking of the whole, um, you know, uh, opera is for everybody mm-hmm. thing, because I really love that. And I, I, I've always been drawn to it. And, um, well, it's cause it's amazing. It, 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 it floored yeah. me that, um, because I, I, I know they still write modern operas that happens, mm-hmm. but for some reason, when I think of it, I don't think, you don't think of the new stuff. I don't think of new. And, and, and this, I, uh, this sounds so cool. It's uh, the Malcolm X, Life and Times of Malcolm X. Yeah. Opera. Yeah. And it just floored me. I'm like, it's a Malcolm X opera. Yes. it's. A, That's it's like a, the coolest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> and it is. Honestly, it's it's a it's a fantastic show. Uh, we're so excited to be a part of it, particularly yeah. as Malcolm X is from Omaha. I know. Yeah. Right? It's like, a, it's it's a legend, you know, and to be able to, to be here as it's happening is just so exciting. And. And in this, it's a a prime example of what American opera can look like and what it can look like when we decide to really lean into our roots and grow out stories that matter to our people. Yes. Right? Yeah. For sure. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I was floored by that. And And then, yeah, and specifically American opera. Well, Opera Omaha actually has a really great history in the last couple of years of producing new works and yes. new pieces yeah. and being in that space a couple of For years sure. ago um we premiered at the opera proving up by missy mazzoli and royce fabric mm-hmm. that was based on a short story that was set here in nebraska um and you know missy is one of the great composers of american opera going forward and you know we we did that piece proving up uh in 2018 and there was a story about Nebraska and it's new American opera and I think you're not alone in thinking that opera is is a static canon but mm-hmm. I think yeah. I think the part of it is is like it's a really a dynamic and living op- art form and new opera and new opera experiences are being created all the time and that's how um, that's how different people can find their way in and find their space mm-hmm. in in this art form because it is still growing and changing and being created. And we have a canon, but we also have all this new work. Yeah, yeah. for it's, sure. It's an exciting space and it's really expansive space, right? Yeah. Um, and 
I like to say, well, what is opera? I think sometimes sometimes we'll, we'll throw around the term opera and maybe it's like, do people even oftentimes know what that is, right? And everybody kind of has their own opinion because the the field is so wide, right? This is something that has existed yeah. for hundreds and hundreds of years. There's a lot of variety that's actually here. Sure. Um, and in that, I'll tell you that my definition of opera um, is just, it's very wide. And that is that opera is the plural of opus, right? Opus is a work. So to okay. me, to me, opera is the space of many works, right? Which means it's the space where many works come together to tell a story. So many creatives come together to tell a story, right? Okay. Okay. And in that, it's often set to music and it's often including singing. But does it have to? And that's the piece that we're really leaning into um, and amplifying the black experience of oh. really stretching what is opera and really being able to open people's minds mm -hmm. of what is opera when you think about it versus what it can be in reality right now when we're creating Ooh. something today, yeah. right? Not just trying to live in what existed in the Romantic era in the 1800s, but we're saying, what does it look like for people today to come together as different styles of creatives, right? In multimedia and create new stories that we're telling together. I love that. I didn't even think about Opus no. being the same. And well, and, and, and I think that's just, a, <laughs> it's, it's such a perfect way to look at it because yeah, you, you don't want it sort of stuck in the past. Yeah. You don't want it this static historical thing. No, yeah. no, no. And 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 the more yeah, what does it mean to us now? Yeah. Now. We get to define it. And as Americans. Yes. Because mm -hmm. it didn't start here. Yes. <laughs> it didn't. It didn't. And when you think of the traditional canon, um, a lot of it is not American works. It's a lot no. of it's not in English, mm -hmm. right? Right. You, you yeah. have you have way more um, Italian, French, and German yes. um, than you do of of English works, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what's actually really exciting about it yeah. is that we have the opportunity to create the American revolution of what opera looks yes. like that's and really can cool. be. Yeah, and that's what we're doing at Opera Omaha. And I think, you know, as we keep going and talking about this, I think you will get a little taste of that when you kind of start to see and hear about the, the types of things that Lauren and I are actively working on to say what does an American opera company look like yeah. today? And that's a lot broader than you might think if someone just said the word opera to you. Sure. Yeah. We think about it in the space of, uh, especially within our engagement programming, we think of it as opera is our toolbox. We have all of these different art forms that are present mm -hmm. and all of these different yeah. artists and creatives that are present to make an opera happen. And when we do programming, we can pull out all of those different art forms and artists and elements in those creative aspects. And we want to find what's the thing that sparks for someone. Mm -hmm. What's the thing that sparks their connection to a piece? What's the thing that sparks joy for them? What's the thing that they feel a creative connection to? What's the thing that they want to make because they saw yeah. this piece or were inspired by it? And so when we pull out all those elements, I think oftentimes um, opera can feel really overwhelming to people who haven't been in before because it's something that even if we're not familiar with it, we often have a lot of stereotypes about it and some yeah. of them some of them are deserved mm -hmm. uh you know <laughs> but also also the space of um it's a whole genre of art you wouldn't go go to one movie and see a horror movie and be like nope that's it movies are not for me mm -hmm. i'm out right. i would like to get rid of this entire <laughs> form genre of form yes. of entertainment <laughs> um sure. you know so it's like and and we can talk to different people and see like What's that about? Do you want to experience opera in a big hall? And in our in our city, that is, you know, our main stage operas happen at the Orpheum Theater. Is that the experience that you want? Or are you more uncomfortable in like a smaller, like in a gallery setting where we do a recital and mm -hmm. that's how you want to experience opera? Or you want to find opera when we do an opera to go and where you find us at the farmer's market or you find us at the park or yeah. you find us at a festival. Yeah. Those are all opera experiences. It's yeah. not any one thing. And so when you think about it in that way, there's so many more ways to connect with this art form and feel like it can be for you and it can be welcoming. Um, and all of that is great.
I really think of myself as a space creator. I really love creating space for creatives, right? For them to be able to do their thing and to be able to speak authentically because the whole idea is that art should say something, right? And so I like to be an advocate for creatives to be able to say, how do we create spaces where you can say what it is that, that is authentic to you and to know that this art form is much wider than just historically what it's been of primarily white people controlling it. Um, and so having that level of, of authenticity in in the space um, and it's been really exciting to get into the the producing and directorial side of that um, and expanding like what does digital um, look like and there has been some digital creation that has happened in opera but saying how do we continue to grow that out and you know one of the things that I saw a need for when coming here is opera music videos right like that that ah. just doesn't really exist you won't find it go look for it um, that, that feel modern yeah. that feel really modern and that it's just the video so it's maybe taking traditional music and making it feel visually fresh oh mm. nobody's doing that That's no no, nobody's really doing it and, well, and if you're out there and you're doing it do hit it. me up because maybe I, I, I actually i'm a person and i don't know everything so if somebody has seen something <laughs> yes. that i haven't seen let me know why in my perspective Wow, opera music videos. Yeah, I'm excited about it. We actually have one that's going to be coming out in October. Oh, um, oh my and God. Yeah, it's just fun that. stuff. And, and that's always, I think, the hard part for performance art because of copyright and different things like that mm -hmm. to be able to do. That's why you just see a lot of pictures and you don't get to see. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, bet, I bet there's a whole... Rights are that. real, my friends, <laughs> and, and those rights exist. Yes, so Andrew yes. Joy and I were literally talking about it yesterday. But you know, yes, yes. but also as 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 artists and creatives, you know, we're also like we get it because we want artists to get paid yep, right. for their stuff and yep. for their work. But yeah, it's a whole. Um, it, I mean, that whole thing is is creating a whole different type of art, and it's when you walk into creating and producing any new type of art and artistic experience there are things that you have to there's things you have to learn there's things like like as you're in that space and I think you know the way that talking about that virtual creation and the way that I think it's gone from even I think the first time we talked was like April 2020 yeah. and we yeah. are now in September of 2022 and in yeah. that time frame the idea about like what does virtual programming look like mm -hmm has shifted so much and I think has also shifted in a really beautiful way of like we are now seeing that as its own art form and as its own discipline as we should yeah. and we're not in the space where we're trying to like we will record a staged version of something and then release it we might do that you know we have concerts or where we'll say sure there's a virtual version of this concert mm -hmm. but when you're talking about music videos and being in that space what you're talking about is like this is a whole different form of art and we're going to think about it in that yes. way and we're going to concept it in that way yes. and so we're going to build it mm. in that way because we're thinking about how do we want to share that vision mm. how do we want to share that piece of art in a way that speaks to the art and speaks to what we're trying to get across but also is a really great experience for our audience mm -hmm. yeah. you know I think I think we spend a lot of time in the performing arts creating things but we're creating things for an audience all of the time. Like that's what yeah. that's what we're here for. We want yeah. people to see it, yeah. and we want them to have a good experience while they're seeing yeah, it. Yeah, we want them to be changed from the time they go in to the time they walk away. Right? Mm -hmm. That it was something that sparked. Right? That Lauren was talking about. It's something that sparked something yeah. in you. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And we have really taken a lot of um, effort to say, how do we focus in on local, right? Like, mm -hmm. how do we focus in yeah. on local creatives, on what matters to the people here, mm -hmm. um, and helping grow out opportunities in spaces, right? Um, and there's a, there's a few things that I think we could, we could talk about with that. Um, I'll start with, with um, particularly with Amplifying the Black Experience, yeah. um, that the mission of the space is unboxing the operatic experience in unique and unexpected ways, right? Telling, um, focusing in on stories and voices of black people, right? This is a space for everyone, but focusing in on black voices and black stories with an emphasis on black creatives and local creatives, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Local creatives, letting the people here redefine what opera can look like 
for them, right? Letting them be in the driver's seat, right? And if you even take something like poetry and music, you want to talk mm-hmm. a little bit about poetry and music, where it's real focused on local? Yeah, so we are in the sixth year of our poetry and music project where we work with Nebraska Writers Collective and we invite students in Nebraska and Iowa in K through 12 to submit poems on uh, themes. This year's theme is finding your voice and then there's some sub prompts and themes within there. And then professional composers will look at all of the poems that get submitted and select a handful of them and set them to original music that are that's then performed in a concert. So that project happens over the course cool. of the whole year. Um, and so, you know, we've opened poetry submissions now and those will close November 30th. Yeah. And then we'll work and we'll also offer writing workshops for teachers with Nebraska Writers Collective Teaching Artists that can happen in October and November. And then, you know, composers get that those poems and they always respond and they're like oh my gosh are you sure you don't have enough time for me to write all of these and it's like we cannot have a five-hour concert <laughs> <laughs> so i do need you to narrow it down like just a little bit <laughs> yeah just so sorry um and so then you know the composers are writing and then the really cool part is the student poets are in the music workshops with the composers and our head of music and singers and are hearing their pieces as music for the first time, but also are responding. And those students, you know, some are like, no, this is great and I love it. And some are like, that is not how I thought this would sound and I need something different. And then the whole piece okay. changes yeah. from that input. So they're part of that creative process all the way through. And then they get to see their piece performed on stage in a yeah. concert in front of an audience. Yeah. And it's really exciting to, you know, it's, yes, there's a concert at the end of the year, but the project is year long because it's so much about that process. And how can we invite people in to see what the process looks like, especially students and especially youth. And when we're thinking about like, uh, how do we know what we want to think about or what we want to do or what we might want to be or being in that space of like these creative processes are so cool. And that's where the magic is, right? Yeah. And so how do, you, how do you keep some of that magic that happens in performance when everything's a surprise in that space? But also, like, what's this, what's this behind the scenes stuff that we can let people into? Because mm-hmm. that's, where, that's where I think the nitty gritty cool stuff happens. And yeah. how do we let them into the transformation, right, that occurs from going from poetry yeah. to music? And so yeah. actually it was, it was this program that um, I've tried to build out some of the stuff that, that we've been doing in ABE, um, as we call it, Amplifying the Black Experience sometimes. So in ABE, in that space, um, one really clear way you could see kind of that connection um, is in that the pieces have been really started with focusing in on poets. Some of the poets that we worked with Um, so far is their local creatives, um, Jewel Rogers, Ryan Boylan, Noni Williams, and taking poetry and turning it into music, right? And another thing that we've been doing is saying, how do we like remix traditional spaces? And so at um, our first live event that we did for Juneteenth, which completely sold out, which was really exciting, we did it at Coneco. And in this space, for the, the second part of the experience, um, it was a remixed art song recital, and it was poetry by uh, Langston Hughes, um, and it was composed by Margaret Bond, Songs of the Seasons. And so what we did is we read the poetry before each song was sung. So we read the poetry so you could experience it as poetry. Mm-hmm. And then straight into the music so you can hear the transformation. There's really something special about poetry yeah. and music and when poetry and music collide, yeah, yeah. right? You can feel the transformation. Yeah. For sure. Oh, how neat. That's really cool. That's a really neat idea. It is. It is. I love, and I know that you also do a lot of talkbacks or, mm-hmm. well, I think they're called pre- prelude so we, pre- we have a variety talks? of, yeah. of uh, talks, <laughs> and so it depends. It depends about the timing of of where they are. Yeah. Um, so we do a series called Opera and Conversation, which is three conversations, two are before the opera, one is following, and they're really about using the opera as a as a jumping off point. Uh, the first in the series is about the behind the scenes process. It's about insights. It's about this piece. It usually includes artists who are on the creative team from the show to really you know what might be more traditional is like a a pre-show talk of like let's get some of that 
inspiration? What does the process look like? What are things that if I'm going to come and see the show, like, oh, the director told me like about this special insider thing that now I know about, or the costume designer told me about like the fabric inspiration for this piece. And now I'm going to go see the opera and I'm going to look at that costume a little bit differently. Uh, and then the next, uh, the second one is always with a is with a community partner or varieties of community partners, and taking one theme or topic or something that's present in the opera, and directly relating it to our community partners and the work that they're doing and what's happening in this community right now. So um, a really easy tie for that for for Malcolm X is we're actually working with the Malcolm X Memorial Foundation uh, throughout we you know throughout about a whole year kind of leading up to and around this opera. Um, and so there have been formed a lot of our community work around this opera, but also they'll be doing the, you know, this opera and conversation about Malcolm X's connection to Omaha, what the Omaha context and history of uh, this piece is. Mm-hmm. And then um, thinking about those local artists and creatives, our third opera and conversation follows the opera. And it's about an artistic response to this piece. And it's with local artists and creatives who have seen the opera, have experienced the opera, and their feedback. Yeah. What did they think? What did it spark for them? What connections and ties do they see to their own artistic practice? They typically would not define themselves as opera artists. There's no one from Opera Omaha on that panel mm-hmm. because it's not about the intent of the opera or the intent of the artistic experience. It's actually about the artistic experience. Yeah. It's about and, the impact. Yeah, and it's about that space too for our audience to in thinking about a talk back that's that space for that audience to say this is how i experience this piece mm-hmm. or this is what i experience or this is a thought that you brought up in this conversation that now i'm thinking about in this in this sort of way um and having that space to really have a full conversation about it um and it's not after the opera because n- no one wants to sit in and talk back after a two and a half three hour opera that's like a real long time so we do it on the tuesday <laughs> we do it on the tuesday following um and you know you can come back and, and and think about it a little bit but be in that space and then we do do prelude talks in the lobby before um the opera performances and so those happen immediately before the performance about an hour before they're about 20 minutes and they're just getting people ready to enter this world of the opera. So, you know, we like to say, like, you do not have to do homework before you come to the opera. You can come to the Prelude Talk. They're a delight. Uh, <laughs> and those will help prepare you and get you ready to be in that space. It's not going to walk you through the plot. You can read the synopsis. But, like, what are some things that you want to think about? What are, what are things you might want to know before you, before you go into that space? And it's kind of like, it's like a teaser. It's like a trailer to get you excited to enter that world. And, and we have someone who just does a great job um, in the past in our, our prelude talks of just making it just very exciting um, and a memorable experience before you go even into your next experience, right? And so it really is a tee up of like, don't worry if you don't know anything before you show up. We have got some things taken care of for you. At least we, we absolutely do try to make it a space where you just feel warm, you feel welcome, you feel like it's, it's just easily digestible and understandable. Yeah. So just, just come into the space and we've got you from there. Mm-hmm. And if you leave with questions, that's exactly what the Opera and Conversations is yep. made for following, yeah. right? For you to be able to get those questions out and yeah. to be able to have conversation about it, right? Because there is no right or wrong answer to the questions that you ask. It's, they're just opportunities for greater uh, connection points mm-hmm. um, for you to be able to express yourself about what it is that you experience and that's what opera is about right how is yeah. it starting the conversation and what is it speaking to that matters to our people today right and when I say our people I mean our community yeah. right and when I say our community I mean Omaha but I mean much wider than that I just mean sure. like the collective experience that we're going through mm-hmm. right and I think um, X the life and times of Malcolm X is a great point to jump off of, right? Malcolm X is from Omaha. Imagine what this means for people to be able to see someone's life that came from this land. Yeah. 
mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. I mean, there's something so special about that. And one of the greatest civil rights leaders in history. And yes. it's it's just, it couldn't be at a, at a better time, right? I don't know um, if everyone's aware, but Malcolm X just got voted on to be inducted into the Nebraska Hall of Fame. Oh, I did not uh, hear Malcolm that. Malcolm X Excellent. would be the first black person that's going to be inducted in. Really? Yeah, I mean, it's so exciting. Yeah. And I, I will say as, it, it just feels so special as a black woman in this moment in time to be here putting on a work like this. And I also also got the opportunity to speak at the hearing for it about getting inducted, right? And how important it was. Mm -hmm. And and I think this opera will really open people's minds to what Malcolm X's life was all about. What's the legacy that came from it. And you feel like you get to go on a historical journey. And there's something super unique in particular about this opera that you will be hard pressed to find. And that is, it actually starts in Omaha. Yeah. The beginning of the opera is set in Omaha. It's wow. the beginning of his life, and his life began here. How great so is that? Omaha mm-hmm. is in an opera, right? That will that will exist for hundreds of years, yeah. right? And it's a living composer, Anthony Davis. So this is an opera that came out in the '80s, actually, and it's going through a revival right now. That we're a part of a consortium group that's putting it together, um, and so other opera companies around the country right now are saying, how do we expand this story for more people to see the importance of Malcolm X's life, to see the importance of American opera, and to see the importance of the impact that telling the right stories at the right time can have. Yes. So how did this come about that Opera Omaha decided to do this? Were, was that something that you brought to the table? That you? How did that all happen? So that happened from, uh, we were put in touch with Detroit Opera, who oh. was really exploring this to, to bring it back to kind of start the revival. And so they reached out to us and said, you know, the story starts in Omaha. Would you be interested? And, um, and so we, you know, got on board. And so originally it was us in Detroit Opera. And then other opera companies when he started hearing about it and we're like actually we want we would like to be we would like to be part of this too so now additional members of that kind of consortium it it yeah I was in detroit it. it will it's getting a full production here um it's not it's not a tour. It's not like when you when you see a Broadway tour. Right. This is Omaha's production of Malcolm X, and yes. it's part of this consortium, which allows us to make it kind of you know bigger and more. Seattle is also part of that consortium. The Metropolitan Opera in New York is part of that consortium. Nice. It will be part and Chicago Lyric, and Chicago Lyric uh, the, with the Met. It will be part of the Met HD streaming series. So the other great part is, oh, you know, we cool. think about who can see that opera, but also when it goes to the Met, it will be live broadcast. It will be recorded. It will be broadcast out to the yeah. thousands of cinemas across the country that oh, do Met okay. HD. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, and we were really in the in the ground floor creative process for that. And that's really cool. Yeah. Um, you know, so as Omaha has an opera about it, but also to know that Opera Omaha has a stamp on this production. We've, you know, been on the planning calls from for day sure. one. So yeah. it's, it's really incredible to be part of an opera on this scale. Yeah. And as it's in other spaces, no one else, no one else has the historical connection that Omaha has of it being Mm -hmm. Malcolm's birthplace, right? I mean, how cool and dope is that to be able to see something about someone's life, the span of their life, knowing that you're sitting in the space where it all started, right? I mean, it's it's something special that you won't be able to get it. You won't be able to get that anywhere else. No, you you have to get that. You have to get that right here on November 4th and 6th down at the Orpheum (laughs) Theater. Go to our website, uh, operaomaha.org. Get your tickets tickets we firmly believe in making art accessible so there's a range of yes. prices for the tickets this is cool. the one for you if you thought that i don't like opera this is one for you to come out Try check out and yeah. be able to see what the the beauty and excitement of opera is all about you know you have the singing you have the orchestra you have the visual arts that are there you have technology that's involved in it you have dancing that is world class all in your face coming at once and that's just the top wow yeah because you have a total of three in your season mm-hmm. so the the one after this soir <laughs> soir angelica not heard of that one newer older 
it, uh, it's, older. <laughs> it's older. It's, it's a Puccini opera. Yeah. Okay. And it's okay. A, very good. And it's a one act opera. So it's great in that way that it'll be um, oh, okay. a little bit of a shorter experience. So if you're yeah. also like, mm, time, uh, that is the end of February. And it's a beautiful, if you, if you're familiar with, um, Puccini operas, which many people are, uh, even one if they don't know it. Too. Yeah. Yes. It's just beautiful, mm. stunning music. Um, and it's a really going to be a really great piece. We have a really um, great creative team on that. It's the end of February, so that will be our winter opera. And that's a one act opera. And that's mm-hmm. a one act opera. Okay. Yep. So. Um, and that's February. T- here. February twenty fourth and twenty sixth. Twenty sixth. Yeah. And then we're kind of going like backwards in time. Yes. Right? So <laughs> we, we have, we have uh, X, the life and times of Malcolm X. We have Swan Angelica that comes and then we have the marriage of Figaro um, is, is the final one. So it's a great, it actually really is a great way to step in um, yes. to opera the way the season has been curated of you getting to see just how wide the variety can be. Mm-hmm. And then also yeah. going back from something that's a little bit more modern, getting into like quite traditional. So we, we go yeah. from like modern contemporary, to romantic era with Puccini getting into straight mm-hmm. classic with Mozart. With right? Marriage of Figaro. Yeah. Got, I mean, it's got to be the most famous ever. I, I think so. It's I in mean, the top. It's in the top. And you get all those, you get all be, those right? great Commedia dell'arte tropes. You, you know, this yes. is part of that Marivo trilogy. And so you have all of these familiar characters who are there. Yes. And it's a comedy that is just a delight to yeah yeah, it's absolutely a comedy so great in that like end of march time frame (laughs) uh (laughs) for for something lighter and thinking about you know all of the things that happen in a romantic comedy which at the end of the day that's kind of what this what this opera is it's one of those i've always wanted to see and i've seen pieces of it and honestly i'm of that generation where this this Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd showed me <laughs> this, <laughs> and I've, I, I've been I've been hearing this since I was three years old. Well, that's what I think. Both with Puccini music and Mozart music, yes. so many people are like, "I don't know opera." I'm like, "I actually, I bet yes, you, do. you do. I bet you do. <laughs> okay, you, you saw it. At, you saw it yeah. in Looney Tunes. You've seen it and in, in my generation, movies. That like, was, that, yeah, it was like, oh, okay, that's what it's, and it's like I, I got to see this. Yeah, I got to see this. You have. It's gonna be. It's gonna be really great. We're excited to do it. It was. It is the last piece that that got COVID delayed, and so was it's it had. Okay? It's had three or four different dates, uh, and now okay. it's really happening, and that's we're so excited to real, be able to to be able to have it, and with much of uh, you know much of the same cast who the was planned as part of it, Excellent. and so it's going to be a really uh, it's going to be a really great season because as Andre Joy said, there's so much you know balance. There's kind of yeah. that space of of like we talked about of. And that's not by accident. That's very much a choice about like how do we have a little bit mm-hmm. of all the things. We're really conscious that we're the professional opera company For in Nebraska. Nebraska. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so, you know, yeah. thinking about in how that works in season planning and, and thinking about what types of, of opera yeah. do we want to bring and do, you know, for people to see. So that idea that over the course of, of these months, there's a little bit of something for everyone. And, and I'll, I'll lean into what, what she said just a moment ago, which is we are the only professional opera company in Nebraska, right? Mm-hmm. So that means we have a responsibility to reach as many uh, people as we can, right? And in many different, as many different age groups as we can, right? And so we have the, the three big shows, the, the grand stage shows that we're talking about, mm-hmm. um, yet there's so much more that we have in addition to that, right? And so if being inside of a big theater is not your thing, don't worry, we've got you, right? (laughs) We've got you. There are different types of performances and experiences that exist, right? And in that way, we've, we've talked about a few of them with poetry and music. We've talked yes. about um, amplifying the black experience. Yes. We've talked about the Holland Community Opera Fellows, right? We've talked we about- We haven't talked about the fellows. So- <laughs> We gotta talk. We gotta talk about that. Let's talk about that. So we have our Holland Community Opera Fellowship, which is for artists who are with us full time to do community based and community engaged work. And uh, we work with partners around uh, the metro area and really serve as a creative and artistic resource. And think about the way that we do opera and arts programming in that way of how do we help these partners who are working on really big 
community needs. We're talking about um, organizations who are working in the space of homelessness, who are working in the space of working with immigrant and refugee populations, who are working on um, addressing some of those issues that Andre Joy talked about with segregation in this community. Mm -hmm. And we're working with the partners who are doing great work in those spaces and, and seeing how can we bring in what we do and what do you need? And how can we supplement and be in that space? And so our fellows are out, um, and over the course of the year, we'll probably do in the space of 175 to 200 workshops and programming with youth, with individuals who are experiencing homelessness, with immigrant and refugee populations, with adults with disabilities, with individuals who are in, um, you know, in different residential communities and spaces, and thinking about how, like we talked about, how do we find those opera spaces that connect for people, that spark their joy, that spark their creativity, that give them a space to come in, uh, in that way, and in the way that serves those broader community needs. Um, and so that's what the that's what the fellowship is is really all about. And we're in our sixth year of programming for that. And so those community partnerships and that programming. Um, you might, you know, if you're out in the public, you might not see it, you might not know about it because it's yeah. it's with our partners and there's mm -hmm. not as much in those spaces, but you've probably met some of our right. some of our fellows. We have four great fellows. We have Jamie Marie Webb, who is a soprano. We have Fernando Antonio Montano, who is a poet and a writer. Taylor Adams is a director and a scenic designer and a scenic artist. And Carissa Ramsey is a playwright and an actor and a director. And so they're really thinking about all those different ways that art comes into opera, those different art forms that are part of opera, and how do we break those down yeah. and make it connectable yeah. and accessible to people? How do we, how do we welcome people in, in spaces? And really, that program is all about meeting people where they are. Often physically, we're often physically oh. on site, mm -hmm. okay. you know, often physically on site at, with partners and, you know, and in those spaces and offering that connection um, in ways that are, often really unexpected, mm -hmm. uh, but then really joyful. Yeah, and, and in that space, it's like really leaning into with the, the various opportunities that we have for engagement to hopefully express that if you are a creative, if you are a creative, and we all are, if you are a creative, <laughs> there is a space and a place for you in opera. It all exists here. It yeah. all exists here. And if it doesn't exist yet, we want you to create it. I love that. And I, I love that Opera Omaha has a lot of free events. Too. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, they sure yeah. do. Yeah, you guys have a bunch of them. So you always do That's the right. Opera Outdoors in August yeah. every year. Even during the pandemic, I think you were able to at least one of the years. We did. We did a. We actually did a radio broadcast opera outdoors. So it was a I little tried. bit of a. It was a little bit of throwback. We partnered with KVNO and did a radio broadcast of opera outdoors. So you had to be in your own outdoors. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but uh, but we but we did it that way. So That's we've right. been able to do that every year. We do. We have a series of outdoor neighborhood concerts called Opera to Go, where we're at farmers market and festivals and events. We're at yeah. neighborhood. Right. Uh, block parties and concerts and so you might stumble upon us in your neighborhood um, we also have a series of recitals that we do at gallery 1516 as part of their bagels and sometimes box series so we have two of those this fall we don't have dates for the spring but we probably will um, there's always you know pretty consistently over the course of the year we'll have probably 20 free events yeah. uh, at a minimum that you can come and and find out and see and and part of that is too is that idea of like if if you don't know if this is like totally for you then like you know what come test it out right. yeah. see if this come, feels come good give us, come give us a shot right and and we like to pop up in, in unexpected places yeah. right yeah. so sure. um amplifying a black experience we actually just had um a performance and experience that we did at hutch fest okay. right so hutch fest just happened on september 4th and it was it was great it was showing the extravaganza of, of the different parts of opera and showcasing local creatives and there was there was dancing there was singing there was visual painting that was happening in the space right because my thing is how do how is it also an experience for you and how are you a part of the experience right mm -hmm. so i love bringing in um, particularly we've had gavin mitchell um thus far i love bringing in a visual artist to paint in a space and say because you are here you are now influencing the art that is being created 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I explicitly say to Gavin, like, Gavin, take some time through the space and feel it out. Feel. Mm-hmm. What do you feel? And like use that vibe to create and knowing that each and every person in the space, they matter because they're creating that vibe. We're sure. doing it as a collective. Yeah. And so we're creating art as we show you art. Wow. And there was over 12,000 people at Hutchfest last year. Was it really? Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Just a nice. couple weeks ago. That's great. And so it's just, it's, it's <laughs> exciting to, to show. And a lot, we had such, so many great reviews, so much positive testimonials of people saying, I didn't know opera could look like this, mm-hmm. right? This feels so good. It feels so great seeing people of color in yeah. opera, right? Yeah. And it, it just is really unexpected. Right, um, and saying when when is the next thing? We can't wait for more. Right, it's it's so exciting to be a part of saying that opera is so much more than even we think it is. Right, mm-hmm. than even we think it is. Yeah. yeah. So I know when we talked to Lauren before on the podcast, we asked her, you know, how she got into it and what was the most powerful part of opera for her that led her to where she is today. Um, I, what, it, what is the most powerful experience that you've had in opera? Mm. And did you start out young in opera or like, well, I know you did. I know Lauren did. Kind of young. You were in school. Mm-hmm. Anyway, <laughs> I, I was 18 when I got into opera, but maybe 17, wow. right? I was 17, 18 when I got into I opera. Still, yeah. Um, still young, yeah. yeah. And so, well, that was, it was kind of late, right? Especially because I went like the conservatory route and all of that. Oh, okay. um, it was, so it was, it, it was like an interesting experience. Um, but in that, I got into opera just volunteering at the Atlanta Opera. One of my friends invited me to volunteer with her. And she said, well, if we go, we'll get to see the show for free. They just happened to be doing Porgy and Bess, which oh, is one cool. of the only only primarily all black cast yes. operas. Oh. And so after greeting people to come in, we got to just find empty seats. And so I think we sat on the third row. Perfect. And I remember sitting there saying to myself, well, one, whoa, I didn't really realize black people were in opera, right? And two, is this a thing? Uh, yeah. I can, I can do this. Yeah. I, I sound like this when I do the dishes. <laughs> I can do this, right? That's great. And then I could. And then, <laughs> and then I did. <laughs> right? Like, and, and it's, it's like, yeah. that's, that was probably the most transformational moment that I've had in opera, right? Like, that literally well, changed the whole trajectory of my yeah. life. Representation matters. Yeah. And it's so it important. Everything. It's so important to make sure we are trying to give a wide show of representation. You don't know who's in the audience and who it is that we are impacting and affecting that can change the trajectory of their life. And I don't say it just out of saying it. I say it because I know it and I say it because I lived it and my lived experience has me right here with you today. I love it. And I I think (laughs) what's so funny (laughs) is uh, my first opera experience um, was an Opera Omaha free student dress rehearsal. Oh. And so one of the reasons that, you know, similar to Andrea Joy saw her first opera for free as a volunteer, you know, one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about us doing free student dress rehearsals for all of our shows is that that was the first time I saw an opera was sitting in the Orpheum Theater and, mm-hmm. and seeing a free student dress rehearsal. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it comes a little full circle because I now run that program. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, you don't, no one knows, no mm-hmm. one at Opera Omaha, like, you don't know how to track all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I wouldn't say it's my most, I, it's hard to say what my most transformational moment is because I have them every week when I stand in the back of our workshop programming and, like, mm-hmm. see people have those creative spark moments mm-hmm. um, oh, yeah. and be in that, and be in that space. But I love when we do student dress rehearsal. I love standing right off to the side. I have a little space that I stand at the Orpheum Theater and I run up those stairs when it's time for all of the bows and seeing how students are reacting to the opera because for so many of them, this is also their first experience. They also maybe, you know, have never thought about it before. And that's also like the most genuine response to an opera. They don't have all of this built-in stuff about how they should be experiencing Mm -hmm. opera. And we don't want them to. Like, I want you to have a genuine reaction um, to what this to what this show is and what's happening um Mm. and you know they don't they don't know that i'm standing there at the side of the theater with my little like nightlight seeing eyes and you know (laughs) seeing those reactions in a dark in a dark theater and 
you can see on faces when someone has that moment where that art has just like given them goosebumps. Mm-hmm. And so I get that feeling standing in the back of the theater watching students' reactions. I get that feeling standing in the back of the workshop watching people. So for me, opera and my job is about making those experiences possible for other people. Yeah, I can sit in a dark theater and watch a show and like I love it, but mm-hmm. I get so much more feeling watching other people have that experience and making that experience possible for other people. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how rewarding that's got to be. Oh, so rewarding. On top of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, last year when we brought student dress rehearsals back and it was, you know, the last school year was so weird. Um, Yeah. It's all been so weird uh, for the last couple of years. But, Mm -hmm. you know, being able to come back with student dress rehearsals and have see those students again who are just so excited and knowing the mountains that their teachers moved to get like this field trip approved to like make that happen and be in that space and I had one teenager say to me this is the best night of my whole year and I was just like okay great yeah great like this is just like this is this is why we do it like this is why we do all of this because I had that experience Andrea Joy had that experience and it changed how we saw our lives Mm -hmm. you know it changed I you know wasn't in opera the whole time in the same way that Andrea Joy was but I remembered that feeling and that experience yeah and I remembered what that is like and I know that I want other people to experience it yeah yeah yeah. And I think more people really need to. And I, I'm saying that on the heels of everything that's happening in Nebraska football right now. <laughs> you know ah. what I mean? Because, and, and the millions of dollars that are available. Absolutely. And I've, I've kind of been, um, I've kind of been saying a few things under my breath <laughs> a little bit about all of that. So, it, because the arts are, we, we always kind of get shot out. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that that's doing everyone a huge disservice. Absolutely. Um, we, the art and creativity can be the space that is the light that illuminates a culture. Yep. Right? It's essential to a culture. It's essential to growth. It's essential to innovation. Mm-hmm. And it's so hard when that's not always recognized. Yeah. And that's why one of the things you, you heard me saying earlier, um, I think of myself as a, as a space creator, right? And in that space, I want to create sustainability, even for artists, for artists to get paid and for artists to be able to have living wages mm-hmm. to be able to create comfortably. It's hard to create when you feel suppressed and oppressed, yeah. Yeah. right? Almost Just in general impossible. for anybody, yeah. right? right? It's hard to be in that space of all these ideas flowing to mm-hmm. you. And if we want to be a city that is thriving, we have to be a city that puts the work, time, effort, attention, and resources into our arts and into our creativity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For sure. I know you wanted me to uh, bring up something because we were talking oh. earlier about um, um, sort of uh, looking around and then you guys and you've addressed several things. Opera Omaha mm-hmm. kind of looked around and said, hey, nobody's doing this. Mm-hmm. We're going to do that. Period. Yeah. And, and, and the value of that and, yeah. and, and the wisdom, frankly, to be able to stop and go, OK, what? What's not happening here that yeah. we need? What do we need? Yeah. I think, you know, I think what you're talking about is is so important because we don't create art in a vacuum. No. We don't create art in a vacuum of our city. We don't create art in a vacuum of the other arts organizations that are that are here, that the, of the other artists that are here. And so um, especially when we're talking about our engagement work and our engagement programs, I think Andre Joy was talking earlier about, you know, this community and how Omaha, uh, you know, wants to connect you with other people and be in the space. And when I left Omaha, I didn't realize that that was like a special thing because it's when you're around it all the time, you're like, mm. isn't everybody like this? Mm-hmm. And then you go somewhere else and you're like, oh, no, no, not really. <laughs> they not like want to keep everything to themselves. And Omaha is not that way. And it's, you know, and so that space for collaboration, I think our work has only gotten better as you know as we 
connect and we collaborate and we work with other local artists and creatives and also that ability to see things in a different way Mm -hmm. to see things from a different perspective is absolutely part of it and absolutely you know when we think about uh the fellowship we got to ask a lot when we first started the fellowship they're like well why are uh, other opera companies would be like well why are you doing this work like why isn't another arts organization in Omaha doing we're like I don't know but they're not so we're we're going to and then also knowing that like Mm -hmm. now that we're in that you know, in that space and, and doing that work, now some other organizations are starting to be in that space because they can see what's possible. So sometimes you have to, you have to make that choice of being like, I think this is a thing that we might need, but also we're going to listen to all the other, like, we're going to listen to this community. We're going to listen to our partners. Mm -hmm. We're going to listen to our community panel that helps guys and steer us and say, like, we're thinking this thing, is it, is it real? Or is it not real? Or, you know, tell us what tell us what you need. Tell us what you're seeing and and being in that space. Um, and that's how we can, you know, I think that's where some of the like coolest stuff comes out of. Yeah, and I think sure. it's it's leaning into um, how do you see gaps, right? How do you create things that maybe didn't exist before? Hashtag that's creativity. That's creating. <laughs> there you go. Um, but the power of perspectives right? The power of perspectives, the power of your perspective. And you are the only person that has your perspective. You're the only person that's had your lived experiences in the exact order that they came in and affected you the way that they affected you. And that gives you an innate ability that no one else has, right? And so in that space, how do you use your perspective to listen, as Lauren was saying, to listen and to look around and see where there are gaps, right? See where there are gaps. And then to say to yourself, this is what I say to myself. And so I will share it with you all here and whoever Mm -hmm. is listening. I do not have to reinvent the wheel to streamline it. Mm. Right. In a space where so much has been created, people have been around for a long time. (laughs) A lot has been created. Sometimes you feel like, I don't know how to come up with something new. Everything already exists. Right. right? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't have to reinvent the wheel to streamline it. Where is there a space that you see potential for streamlining? Mm -hmm. And then focus on that. Run your race. You don't have to try to run the race that someone else has already run. You don't have to try to walk down the path that someone else has already created. Create your own path. Run your own race. See something in your space that makes you happy and start with that. Mm -hmm. And then as you go along that route, see where you feel like it could become a little bit more efficient, a little bit more optimized, a little bit more streamlined. And focus in on that. And that's doing the work of making the world a better place. And isn't it interesting? I know that there was a time where if you were an artist or if you, uh, any kind of creative, you you could get a paid a really good wage to, mm-hmm. to do whatever mm-hmm. it was that you do. And I don't know where we got away from that, but we most certainly have. And I don't, I don't know the history of that. I'm, I'm a history lover, but I don't know the history of that. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and, it's, and it's interesting that we've evolved to this place where now we, ha- we have to be cognizant of making sure that our creatives can make some money of their, oh, yeah. Yeah. their art. I yeah. mean, one of our... One of our core tenants at Opera Omaha is that every artist and every person who works with us on a project gets paid for everything, for engagement programs, for performances, for, for those things. And, um, you know, it's part of how do we have a creative economy in, in this city and Omaha is so great for so many things. And as like a overall city, we are not great at paying our artists Mm -hmm. and, and thinking about that. And I think we, that's one of the things that we as a city now, as we're, you know, kind of coming into this new stage of, of where we are now, what's our current reality is I would love to see us think about how do we come together as, as an artistic community in that way and kind of think about how do we, support a creative class yeah. here in Omaha so that because otherwise we'll lose it yeah you know and we're and it's essential yeah it's yeah. essential mm-hmm. and you know we have all of these you know all of these people who have all of this amazing potential and these amazing ideas and all of this <laughs> so many dope so m- yeah there they, they, so they really are here. And we want them to stay in Omaha. Yeah. yeah. And, and in that, I think it's really important. It's really important to say that 
One, thanks for giving people opportunities. Exposure is great, mm -hmm. yet money is what pays bills. Money is yes. what puts food in people's mouths. Like exposure yes. is fantastic. <clears throat> giving people opportunities is fantastic. Yes. And yet people also need to have money yeah. to make it out here. And artists have the hardest time saying that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Man. Well, it's an uncomfortable conversation sometimes, we, right? It's, uh, it's because so hard. I think sometimes we don't want to lose the opportunity, right? right? Mm -hmm. But you get to choose your standard. Right? You get sure. to choose your standard in your mind, and then you also get to choose your standard in your reality. Right? Yeah. And so, in you, how do you have courageous conversations? Right? Honesty is the only thing you can work with. How do you have courageous conversations with yourself before you even do it with others? And if your thing is like, I love creating, I love art, I also am going to have to start loving the negotiation process mm -hmm. and loving bringing yeah. up that I need to get paid and being willing to ask, are we getting a little bit off? Because that's a talk I have with yeah. creative. But yeah. being, willing, <laughs> being willing to ask early in the process, is this paid? Yeah. yeah, and not be yeah, not be afraid or think that yeah. that's a wrong question. And and I think yeah. we as you know acknowledging our position as like an institutional arts organization that's been around for sixty plus years, mm -hmm. we can also take on that responsibility by saying like we are going to pay people and we are going to let them know when they ask them to do a thing that this is a paid position mm -hmm. and what the budget is. Yep. Yeah. And yep. and yeah. that yeah. way they can make. They, that way they can make that choice yeah. and, and be in that space. But we can also be in the space of, of acknowledging the privilege and the power that we have and starting that so that no one has to ask us yeah. about it. Right. Yeah. And that kind of goes, I think, into overall what some of the objective is, is how are we making conscious decisions so that other mm -hmm. people can make conscious decisions mm -hmm. to be able to influence positive change and increase empathy and understanding. Yeah. That's the power of art, right? And we are actively working every day to lean into the power of art and expand what art is and what art can look like because art is life and life is art. Absolutely. This is all true. <laughs> I know, I'm just, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited, especially, I mean, ex I'm excited for all of your productions that you've got coming up. Yes. But it's so exciting. The Malcolm X um, mm -hmm. one is mm -hmm. so exciting. That blew me away when I heard about it. I must see it. Yeah, come out. Yeah. Come out. Come okay. out. Come out. Yeah. It's going to be a good time. That's a can't miss. Yeah, it <laughs> yeah. is. It is. I'm telling you right now, get your tickets. This will sell out. I'm sure. Come on out. Have a good time with us. Bring your friends. Bring your families. Make it an experience mm -hmm. for you, and we will do our part. So just show up. Have a good time. That's amazing. Sweet. I, you know, I'm. As I'm sitting here listening to you guys talk, I'm, I'm thinking of when I went to Paris uh, quite, a, quite a while ago, but I went to Painter's Square, mm. and there were actually painters there, and, right. you yeah. know, and they'll, do, they'll paint you or sell their paintings or whatever, and right in Painter's Square, if you've never been there, they, they have, a, like, above the stores that are in this square, there are apartments that those Impressionist painters lived, mm. and you know, that's what they would do. They would live, they would live there in turn for, they'd be able to go to the square and paint and sell their art and create this really, and they all kind of came out of it very, we, I mean, we still recognize them to this day. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same thing with this. Like you're creating something. This is, this is Omaha. Mm -hmm. This is exciting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, someone a hundred years from now could even go back and go, wow, this is where it happened. Mm. This is where mm -hmm. we hope so. We started this. Oh, Come on. High five. Even, well, <laughs> even I think, on a podcast. I think, <laughs> I think that, you know, the part about that too is, is the, the human connection to this art making of the idea of the people who are on that stage are, are also human. And, you know, sometimes we talk with our students about it and we'll do an artist visit, you know, with an artist from the show the week after. And that moment of connection of like, oh, I saw you from the seats at the theater and now you're here in front of me and you're human and you're talking about your experience. Yeah. And that connection to like, we are all human. It's powerful. Mm -hmm. And this is what we create. And this is what we create together as part of that, as part of that experience, as part of that lived experience. And that's that, that space that I think live performing arts and live theater and opera are just really that magical thing because mm -hmm. it is only the thing for that time that you're there and that you see it in that, yeah. in that moment. Mm -hmm. And your experience of it is, is, and being in that space together 
is part of what makes that experience happen. Yeah, and, and I think it mimics life in that way of like when you're on, you're on, there is no off, right? And that's right. like the fun of live theater is yeah. it's live. Yeah, <laughs> there's no it replay. Is, it is there's live, no right? Like you, yeah, you can't yeah. go back. You can't and, and go it, back. It will always be that night, yep. whatever yep. that day, yep. that yep. moment with those people in that room. Mm -hmm. What you night. got, you got, work with that and yeah. keep it pushing, keep going, keep growing in yeah. real time. And that's life. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's so Same. cool about live theater is same, it's same. like life it's it's on there is no off in the middle of a show nope mm -hmm. nope <laughs> <laughs> it, nope <laughs> well, and, and I love that you get to, that you are having these discussions after and before I think it really kind of solidifies what people have experienced in their mind if they can they can go talk about it afterwards too sure. yeah yeah so I think that's you know that's what we want right the goal yeah. is that we create that we create experiences that make you feel something mm -hmm. I was just talking with someone earlier today of like you know if you didn't like it cool let's talk about that if yep. you did like it cool let's talk about that if you didn't feel a thing like oh that's not great yeah. um you know <laughs> so <laughs> that's always the goal like we want you to you know feel these strong feelings and these strong emotions from from this yeah. art from that experience that's when you know that you're like doing a thing right like right. you're doing it good if people are like feeling a certain way about sure. it if they're not feeling anything about it that's when you're like oh we got to do something different yeah. no reaction um, is the worst reaction yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> and so you know we also want to make spaces for that i sometimes think the best conversations that we have and you know with offering conversation when we're there, you know, it's sometimes the best conversation that you have about art is the one that you have, you know, at the at the restaurant after the show. And, you know, how do we make spaces for for those conversations that, you know, we want to hear all of it. And X, The Life and Time of Malcolm X, will be one of those shows that will spark a lot of conversations, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Because as we are talking about someone who was assassinated in the 60s, there's a lot of things, a lot of themes, right, that were real and present in Malcolm X's life that are very much still around mm -hmm. today. Yep. And what I think we're hoping ultimately is that it, it broadens everyone's perspective as they're in the space and as they experience the show to be able to have conversations about where are we now, how yeah. far have we come, and how far do we still have to go, and what can we do to get to how the next phase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah? I bet he never imagined that they would make an opera out of his life. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Probably I mean, really. the last thing on his mind. Probably. Well, opera was pretty big back then, so yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Think about it. Opera, opera was still pretty uh, big in the true. 60s, yeah. so... You know, uh, Malcolm X was a, was a pretty big star. I yeah. mean, if you think there was a lot of visibility oh, um, around Malcolm X. I mean, it is one of the, the greatest civil rights leaders in history. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. I can't, I can't speak for Malcolm. We'll but share, but yeah. if, if I was on a large platform um, at the, one of the most revolutionary times in American history, I might think they make a lot of stuff about me. <laughs> <laughs> might be hoping anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah, please don't forget. <laughs> yeah. We have not. And in fact, made an opera about it. Yeah. 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 Love it. So it, it's, it's really exciting. And there's more. Um, as, as Lauren brought up, we have opera and conversations. And there's even more than that, right? There's, yeah. there's going to be different things and experiences um, happening around the show. Um, and we are going to put um, some different things on our social media and on our website for you to be able to create your own journey mm -hmm. kind of over the three-day weekend of the different um, activities that will be available to you. So it's not, you know, just the show absolutely you can come just to the show hmm. but we we are making it a little bit more robust than that um, yeah. so you have some stuff before you have a little bit during and then there's some stuff after because why cool. we're still in omaha this is yeah. still uh, malcolm x's birthplace it doesn't stop it's, after november 6th exactly. right? no, yeah. yeah he was still oh, born here exciting. <laughs> right. well, it was so nice to meet you thank you, you and too. so yes. nice to see you in person i know yes. thanks for Finally. thanks for having me back <laughs> it's been really great to chat with you yes we you are always welcome on the podcast we love talking about what you all are doing at oh, Opera Omaha. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much thank for you. having Thanks us. Thanks for we having really us. really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you very much to Lauren Medici and Andrea Joy Pearson. Thanks for having us. Our thanks to Lauren and Andrea at Opera Omaha for taking the time to do the deep dive with us about all of the great work being done and connecting with the community in such a determined and intimate way. You can see on faces when someone has that moment where that art has just like given them goosebumps. 
And so I get that feeling standing in the back of the theater watching students' reactions. I get that feeling standing in the back of the workshop watching people. So for me, opera and my job is about making those experiences possible for other people. The Life and Times of Malcolm X will be shown November 4th and 6th with an opera in conversation scheduled for October 25th and two additional talks on November 5th. One about the media and Malcolm X and another about why Malcolm X is still relevant. And an after the curtain call discussion on November 8th. Tickets can be purchased online at operaomaha.org. Thank you for listening and supporting the arts in the Platte River area and beyond. Please subscribe to our podcast so you are sure to catch all of our future episodes and join us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Music for this podcast was used with permission by Screaming Skull Productions. See you next time on the Platte River Bard.